Welcome back to the Champagne on Ice podcast presented by the Field of 68. The off season has officially arrived for Illinois basketball, what should be a very long and very intriguing off season for this program. Illinois goes down to UConn in the Elite Eight. Apologies. We did not record after that game. We'll give some quick thoughts on that, but really we will focus on a very interesting Illinois offseason coming up here and talk about all of it on this episode. I am Kyle Tosk, joined as always by Mike Farmer. Mike, happy offseason. Tough way for the season to end, but uh, this offseason is going to have quite a lot of action to it as it does every year now in college basketball. Yes, it should for sure. Uh, apologies for not uh, putting the pot out last week. I, I woke up like Friday morning after the Iowa State win and I just, I did not have a voice, but I finally came back, came back like this Wednesday or something. I was, I was out for a while, but good to be back. Uh, like, like you said, tough end of the season, but honestly, in my opinion, like even as the game was going on, I, I wasn't really like, I, I wasn't down in the dumps about the season ending, like seeing the guys, the seniors, the fifth-year seniors, these guys that have built the program up, especially this past season, seeing them like check out for the final time was definitely sad. Like that was that was an emotional moment because because of all they've done. But as for the season itself, like I mean, that was the most enjoyable season we've had like in our lifetimes, pretty much. Besides the twenty twenty one season, I would say. And yeah, uh, just they ran into a, a juggernaut of a team, UConn, one of the probably top five best teams of the past like twenty years, according to, according to Ken Palm. So. Uh, some, some strategy issues in the game for sure. I'm, I'm not debating that, but like, I, I wasn't too upset about the way the game panned out. Like the 30 0 run was kind of miserable. Like I can't lie about that, but overall, I'm, I like, I wasn't too disappointed in the way the season turned out. Yeah, no question. Uh, we'll get into a couple of pieces of news that have already hit. Illinois here in terms of transfer news. We'll talk about uh, some of the returning guys on the roster. We'll preview some of the biggest transfer portal needs, but you kind of got into it already. Real quick, before we talk offseason, I do just want to kind of tie a bow on that UConn game since we didn't get to talk about it and just each give some brief thoughts on it. You kind of already did, so I'll go, I guess. It, obviously, you don't want to give up a 30-0 to zero run. That's, you know, I, I, I think – Going into that game, I expected to lose. I, I had very low hopes for Illinois actually beating that team. I mean, you've seen what they've done all tournament long. They're playing for a national title on Monday night. I think they'll win that game. There's no shame in losing to the defending champs, or repeat champs that have just been so dominant and have won their last, what, 14 tournament games or what is it, 12 tournament games by 13 or more points. But at the same time, I did think Illinois could have been more competitive in that game. It was disappointing to lose in the manner they did because I just thought their game plan was really bad. And we kind of talked about it in the preview. Like, biggest key to the game is you got to neutralize Klingon's rim protection and you got to find a way to make him guard. And going right at him every single time down the floor is it's not a – a uh, plan for success, I thought. And when Brad Underwood has his sideline interview in the first half and says, we're just going to keep attacking him. If he blocks a hundred, he blocks a hundred. I'm like, my man, what are we talking about? He need damn near blocked a hundred by the end of the game. So that was frustrating. But like you said, I mean, at the end of the day, we look back at this season five years from now, mm -hmm. and we, we think about a team that was really fun to watch, a team that won the Big Ten Tournament Championship, a team that broke a 19-year drought of getting to the second weekend, and not just that, beat a really good Iowa State team and got to the Elite Eight. And it's at the end of the day, I don't think many people are going to look back in five years and say, oh, well, I'm so mad that we lost to that UConn team and we, we got blown out. I, no one's going to remember that. This UConn team's probably going to win the national title tomorrow night, and uh, and there's no shame in that. So I, at the end of the day, I'm with you, I think. Unbelievably successful season. Couldn't be prouder of this team for doing something that I haven't seen in my 20 years, which is making Elite Eight. Uh, I guess I was one year old the last time they did it. Uh, would have been nice to be a little more competitive in that UConn game, and I think with a better approach they could have been, but um, that's just kind of is what it is. I mean, this UConn team, you, you, even if you have the perfect game plan, they probably win by 12. So it's it, it's frustrating, but nothing you could really do. 
Yeah, like Alabama last night, Final Four, they're shooting 70% at the half, and they're trailing by four or five, I think. Like, we could have played played our A-plus game, everybody hitting threes, and I think it still wouldn't, still wouldn't have mattered that much. But, yeah, I mean, the whole going and clinging thing, <laughs> having him block 100 shots was, like, comical. I, I don't know if, like – Obviously, the game plan was terrible, and but I really don't care at this point. Like, I haven't thought about the loss that much since then. But some of the just the in game stuff, like passing up wide open threes and going at him, was like that was the comical part instead of just that being the game plan. Like, Quincy Garrier having wide open shots on the perimeter and just like going and trying to posterize Klingon. I, I kind of understood once he got his first foul, like it was kind of a random foul. I think he tripped somebody. So, I get if you want to go at him the next five possessions let's say but they did it for the next like 30 possessions so i don't know just they put the nail in the coffin uh by themselves so that, that was tough to watch but overall awesome season i, I really don't have complaints about it yeah and, and the one other thing is that i think you actually got what you needed to get to have a chance to win which was yukon playing a horrible first half yeah I mean, that's Kling, right. Klingon, Klingon kind of dominated inside, but every non-Klingon starter on UConn went one of 17 from the field. UConn had 28 points in the first half. I believe they were one of 11 from three in the first half. And Illinois was down five at halftime. So, I mean, you need with that half that UConn played, you needed to be up eight to have a chance because you knew they were going to hit that other gear in the second half. You knew they were going to make a run. Maybe 30 nothing run is maybe a little bit more than you should have expected. I'm not excusing that. But it felt to me like I know there's two ways you could have looked at it. Like, well, Illinois challenged Klingon 10 times and got blocked 10 times and they're only down five at halftime and they played terribly. And Terrence Shannon had two points at half and they're down five. But really, the way I looked at it was UConn's not going to play that awful a half again. And for you to be trailing, good luck because UConn's going to play a lot better. And if your game plan doesn't drastically change. 25 point loss, which is what happened. So it, the first half was Illinois opportunity to really put some pressure on UConn and head into the locker room and have UConn questioning themselves for the first time. And instead UConn got to go to the locker room and say, we were horrendous and we're up five. Let's, let's go win this by 20 if we play our normal half in the second half. So, um, but yeah, that's pretty much all there needs to be said about that game. We're more than a week out. National title game is tonight. Once this is released, UConn Purdue. Maybe we could give a quick thought each on that at the very end. But let's talk some Illinois off season. It is officially off season time, and like two days after Illinois' season ended, we got two pieces of news already, uh, transfer wise. One transfer out, and one transfer in. So we'll talk about that briefly. Dane Danger enters the portal. Uh, for Illinois, already has a new home. Funny how that works, huh? He's he's already committed <laughs> to a place like five days after the season. That's college hoops for you right now. I'm not saying that's uh, Illinois does the same stuff. They landed a transfer two days after. Just funny. But uh, Dane Danger transfers out, really not a surprise. I mean, I think anybody who watched this team this year realized that Dane Danger could get a bigger opportunity somewhere else. His minutes went up and down all season. Give him a lot of credit. He was massive to Illinois' postseason run, like a guy that easily could have checked out and been looking for a new spot during the season. And when he's getting two minutes and DNPs in conference play, it's not easy for a guy to, to stay focused and be able to play 20-plus minutes and have the types of performances he did in the postseason. But I've expected this to happen since about December and I think it's one that uh, you can't blame Dane for entering the portal. He'll play at Memphis next year. That's where he ended up committing. And uh, it's just one of those situations where you could tell Illinois didn't want to fully commit to giving him a featured role. And I think he probably is talented enough to get that at somewhere like Memphis. So um, your thoughts on uh, Dane Dane entering the portal heading to Memphis. Uh, I think good for him, especially with, the known uh, NIL bags that Memphis is dropping, like good for him. He deserves yeah. uh, he deserves some compensation. One of the Huge numbers I heard him. that he got one of the, the one of the figures that was he was rumored to get is unbelievable for a guy that averaged six points this year. That's all I'll say. Memphis has can, some. Can you share it or not? With. Uh, I won't share the number on here, but it, I'll tell you after we stop recording. All right. I mean, one of their like they have a booster that is like active on Instagram and Twitter. Like, he's a legit booster for their program. He, like, is the one giving money to players. And he's just, like, 
he's under like transfer portal tweets on Twitter and he's just, he's saying like come to Memphis like stuff like that it's, it's really funny but um uh, huge thanks to Dane like he had a fun, he had a fun season last year had some great games against Michigan State some other teams I think and then of course the Big Ten tournament run this year huge against more huge against Morehead State like those are things type of things you remember forever as an Illinois fan and he was a big part of those uh, those games and these teams so huge thanks to him for that but like you said his minutes got cut drastically his uh scoring averages everything like that his all of his stats just way down this year and that was because Coleman Hawkins had a great year like he just he didn't really fit the mold of this team with playing five long athletic guys like he's a kind of back to the basket low post guy Coleman Hawkins is completely different and Coleman kind of just took all his minutes Hans Berry took his minutes a little bit at, at some points in the season too so yeah uh, like you said you could probably see this coming the entire year there were some people saying like who is Dane gonna stay because of this run like no probably not Illinois is probably gonna play a similar style next year uh, as to how they did this year and Dane Danger Dane Danger just doesn't really fit in that mold so really not a surprising uh, move from him but Good for him. Thanks to him for two pretty solid seasons in the orange and blue and looking forward to see what he does next year. Yeah, honestly, I think the run that he made in the postseason actually made him less likely to stay because that uh, NIL check went up, 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 up. <laughs> and so I, I just I don't think Illinois from a role perspective, I don't think that they felt comfortable with the front court pieces they have, the younger front court pieces that they have for next year in Amani Hansbury and Marez Johnson. Plus, obviously, I'm sure they're going to be active in the portal, which we'll get to later in the episode and getting a front court piece. So from a role perspective, I don't think it was a situation where they were going to be able to say, hey, Dane, you're our starting center. You're our featured guy. And for NIL purposes, I don't think Illinois wanted to commit a big NIL, you know, whatever you want to call it, the big NIL price to a guy that they don't know exactly how big his role is going to be, not maybe the most featured guy on the roster. And I think other programs could, and a team like Memphis, who, like you said, has got some big boosters there that are willing to, to buck up some cash for guys like that, especially coming off a disappointing season. I think he made himself some money based on what he did. So that's just kind of what we're, what we're dealing with right here, but, but it, good for him. I'm going to be rooting for Dane next year. There's certain transfer decisions in this kind of transfer age where you feel some type of way about it. Like Jade Epps last year, Sky Clark, those guys, you know, you, you roll your eyes and you, you don't really understand those. And you, you probably aren't going to be fond of those guys throughout the rest of their career. Dane, I hope he has a great year next year. I, I, he was bought in for two seasons. He probably didn't have the role that he thought he was going to when he originally transferred to Illinois, but he still, you know, stayed an unbelievable part of this year's team, even though he wasn't, he was maybe the seventh, eighth guy in the rotation. Illinois is not in the elite eight and does not win a big 10 championship without Dane danger. And it would have been easy for a guy to just kind of check out and, you know, be searching for a new home or um, just, just not have the focus to say, Hey, I, I haven't played a lot this year, but I, I'm, I'm going to stay ready. And if my number gets called and I'm asked to play 23 minutes in a game against Ohio state in the big 10 tournament, I'm delivering 18 and eight to help this team win. So uh, I, I'll, I'll always love Dane danger. I hope he has a great season. That's one of those where I completely understand the decision. And I hope that nobody in the Illinois fan base has any hard feelings about that, about Dane trying to get a bigger role for his final season on college. Other piece of transfer news that hit. On the same day that Danger entered the portal, Illinois landed a commitment from Mercer forward Jake Davis, a freshman out of Mercer, 6'6", a guy who averaged nine points a game, shot 39% from three as a freshman at Mercer. Uh, obviously not the highest profile addition. Illinois expects to probably land some bigger pieces than this, but this is a decent piece to start off the transfer hall for Illinois. I think this is one where clearly this staff saw something in this kid, a freshman who has three years eligibility left, a guy who made a lot of shots. Illinois loses a lot of shooting from this year. And uh, I expect this to be an addition where maybe Davis is your eighth guy next year, a guy who comes off the bench can make some shots for you. And then as an upperclassman, Illinois tries to develop a little bit more out of, but uh, Landon, a guy who shot at 39% at Mercer, Landon, a guy who is a proven shooter and a guy with some upside and some size. I think this is a a, a solid ad, not one that's going to jump off the page at you, but 
clearly the the Illinois coaching staff sees something in this one. Any thoughts from your end on Jake Davis? Uh, like you said, kind of seems like a lower profile pickup, but a couple things I'm optimistic about are extended eligibility. Like this isn't a fifth year senior as much as like staying old and just being old in college basketball has been awesome in general, the past few years for Illinois, especially it's kind of nice to have a guy that can like actually be here for two or three years, maybe, I don't know, like three years instead of just one year, like a one year rental pickup, like Justin Harmon or any of these guys we added this year. And then number two just comes with the three-point shooting. I noticed this with Luke Goody this year, and I, I saw some people bring it up on Twitter when we got Davis, which is why I'm bringing it, bringing it up again. Luke Goody, as much as I, as I love Luke Goody, great shooter, like great piece to this team, and he, ha- he has been for three years. He's only really a catch-and-shoot guy. And like when he's trying to uh, shoot off the dribble or shoot off the screen, like a lot of air balls are going up. And this guy, I've watched some highlights on this guy. He can catch and catch and dribble off the screen, like one dribble pull up, a hit a three, uh, just come flying off the dribble, like whatever it is. He's more of a on the move shooter, and he can hit the catch and catch and shoot threes as well. So that gives me some hope because, like, nothing against Luke Goody, he was our best three point shooter this season, but uh, he's kind of limited in his role. And then obviously being six six two twenty or something like that, like that's a pr- pretty big bodied shooter. That can help defensively, even if he's not the best defender as of right now. Like getting in the weight room and working with this coaching staff for a couple of years will help him for sure. Like having a guy like Alfonso Plummer two years back was awesome. Like you'll take that shooting every day, like every day of the season, you'll take that. But like defensively, he was a bit limited at six foot or six foot one. He got uh, got abused in a couple of games. I doubt that'll happen with this Jake Davis guy. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about this. I like it. Yeah, you basically read my mind on what I wanted to bring up in that he is a guy that the one thing that stands out watching a little bit of him is that he's a guy who can make movement shots. And I think the last time that Illinois had a guy like that was Alfonso Plummer. I mean, the last two seasons, obviously two years ago, awful shooting team this year, big improvement. But it wasn't a situation where you had a knockdown shooter that you could run a set for to get a shot off of multiple screens or or design an action to get a guy a three. Because like you said, Luke Goody's pretty much only a stationary catch and shoot shooter. For as good of a shooter as he is, he does struggle with movement shooting and shooting off the dribble. And this guy is one where Mercer ran a lot of sets to just get him shots running off screens, coming to his his dominant hand whatever it was, and, and he could pump fake and pull up and make a mid-range shot too. So I think there's a lot of shooting upside with him. I'm not saying he's going to be Alfonso Plummer, but a he's that type of like pure shooter that I think Illinois hasn't really had the last couple of seasons. And, and like you said, there's probably some defensive upside just based on the size that he has. He wasn't a good defender at all his for his freshman year, but you got three years to work with him on that. And at the very least, his size can bother somebody off the bench. He's not a guy who's just going to get picked on at six foot. And uh, I think there's some upside on that end of the floor. So I'm interested to see what comes of him. I don't expect him to play a huge role next season, but I think the hope is that, you know, he can make some shots off the bench next year. And then as a junior senior, maybe you develop something more out of the guy and who knows, maybe he starts one day or, or he, at the very least, he's just a really effective, like Luke Goody type of role guy throughout his career, but maybe with a little bit more, you know, aspects to his game offensively than Luke has. So I don't know. We'll see what happens on that one, but let's talk about, the guys that Illinois has returning. Let's kind of take a look at this roster and assess things. Now, it is April 7th as we record this. April 8th will be when we release this. The transfer portal window closes May 1st. So some of the guys we talk about right now could very well enter the transfer portal and not be a member of Illinois anymore as soon as like tomorrow when we record this. But as we record this, we're going to talk about the guys that are still on Illinois' roster and let's just, let's frame it like this because I think there will be another transfer or two from what Illinois has. I don't. I think it'd be naive to think there has to be. Illinois is going to get all these guys back. I, I think someone else is going to leave, and you know I've heard some rumors about it, but I'll save those until they become more public. Let's rank or, or just kind of discuss like 
of the guys that are currently on the roster, who would you want to prioritize most? Like when Brad Underwood sits down with each of these guys and discusses next season, discusses their future, which guy do you most want back? And we can, we can kind of rank them or just kind of name one or two guys that you really would most want to prioritize. Oh man. Um, Number one, I want to hear your thoughts thoughts on this, but I feel like my number one right now would be Amani. Like as much as or as little as he showed last year, like he he really didn't get the minutes last year to show a ton. But like when he was in, you can see like with the high ranking from high school, he's pretty versatile offensively. Like he can he I, he didn't really show a lot of back to the basket stuff this past season, but he can stretch the floor a little bit. He's known to be a really good defender, like really good communicator. Everybody said that the entirety of last season. So I, I think Amani would be my number one, honestly. You're losing Dane. You got Marez Johnson coming in, who should possibly be the starter next season, according to what I'm hearing. I don't know, but I think Amani would be, be my number one right now. Yeah, that that's fair. I think it's probably between the two freshmen from this past season. I would maybe lean towards Dre Gibbs-Lawhorn number one. Um, and it, by all accounts, he should be back. He's said on Twitter that he'll be back. Um, but you never know. I mean, there's there's 24 days for things to change. I would probably give the slight nod to Dre because I think his upside is slightly higher than Amani's. Now, I think you could kind of play both sides of that, too, because I think Amani is probably more stable. Like, you won't have to worry about him leaving. I think he's probably safe, whereas I think you probably would raise some more questions with Dre. But based on what Dre said so far... He should, he, he's bought into Illinois. He likes Illinois should be back next year. And I just think his upside is probably higher. Like I think Amani Hansberry can be a really solid big. Do I see like an all conference guy in Amani? It's possible. I, I don't know if, if that's totally like, I, I think he can be a, a solid big and develop into maybe more of an offensive threat. I think he's always going to be a good defensive piece. He's always going to play really hard. I think he's always going to be a good rebounder. The offensive upside of him, I think, is a little bit more limited, whereas I think Dre Gibbs-Lawhorn could be like an all-Big Ten guard as an upperclassman. Just you see the talent. And obviously didn't have a great season this year, but it's hard to really make much of his numbers based on the fact that he was getting three minutes here and two minutes there and garbage time minutes in this 20 point blowout. So you can see I test wise, throw the numbers out in his three minutes a game this year. The guy is really talented offensively. And I think he's going to be a plus shooter uh, throughout his career. His athleticism is inc- He's the best athlete of all the guys that Illinois has returning. I guess you could argue Ty Rogers, but I just think from a, a scoring standpoint, his athleticism, you could see on some of his drives around the basket. He's got some bounce to him. He's got some burst to him. I think if you hone in some of those skills, obviously work with them on some of maybe the shot selection and, and obviously you're going to need to work with him defensively a little bit, but the guy screams upside. And if you could keep Dre Gibbs Lawhorn around till he's a junior or a senior, I think you could have a a 16, 17 point a game scorer in the big 10 on your hands. And and with Amani Hansberry, I would, he would be number two on my list for sure. But I I just don't know if you have that, like, star-level upside that I think I could see in Dre. Is that fair? Yeah, I get that. I think Dre would be be my number two for sure. And then I think number three you'd probably have to say Sincere Harris. I guess you could argue Ty Rogers as well. I I would maybe give the slight nod to Sincere Harris based on the one extra year of eligibility. And I think there's some unknown there with him, whereas I think we kind of know what Ty Rogers is as a player, and he can be a useful player the next two years, no question. I'm I'm curious to see. Now, I don't know if Sincere Harris is going to be back. I think when he originally redshirted, there were plenty of questions raised about, well, why would he do this? Is he doing this for his next stop, or is he doing this to stay at Illinois long term? Those questions will be answered at some point. But again, taking the the you know context out of it, I think I'm very interested to see what Sincere Harris looks like next season because we know what he brought as a freshman. He changed games as a freshman defensively. We know he's going to be a really good defender. If he stayed at Illinois for the next three years, he'll make an all-defensive team at least once, maybe twice, maybe three times in three years. That's how much of a game changer he is on the defensive end. 
and obviously there's plenty of question marks with him offensively, but who knows? I, I've heard rumors that he's really improved his shot over his redshirt season. If he can make threes, if he can knock shots down, all of a sudden you've got an ace perimeter defender who can make threes. We know he's got the bounce. We know he can play out and transition a little bit, especially off of his own pest work defensively. If he's picking guy picking guys' pockets and running out and throwing jams down, he was an exciting, electrifying player. Again, it's similar to Amani, is he ever going to average 15 and be an all-conference player offensively? Probably not. But he was a really important piece as a freshman, and now you got one year where he spent a year with Adam Fletcher working on his body, getting stronger. And if the rumors are true that maybe he all of a sudden can make shots at a high clip, that could be a really, really good player in the next three years. And the other guys that would be on the list are Ty Rogers, Luke Goody, Nico Moretti would be the other ones to rank. I just think... You know, you get one more year of Luke Goody. I I mean, I want him back, but one more year of we know exactly what he is. He's probably not high on the list. Ty Rogers, I think, will be back, probably will be here the next two years. I just don't know if if he's much more than what he's been uh, this past season. So I don't know. Is that is that list fair? Would would that list be? I know we disagree on the top two, but like. Gibbs, Lawhorn, Hansberry, however you want to rank them. Then Harris, Rogers, Goody, Moretti would probably be the the priority list for me. Any arguments there? Uh, I'm good with the top two. Good with the bottom two. I I, I don't think like you like you said, Luke Goody's ceiling is not being raised drastically in his fourth year, unless it is. Like, but I don't know. I'll, I'll see it. When, or I'll believe it when I see it. Same with Nico. I'm just. I think he's a cool player. Like. He's an interesting piece, like a kind of a true point guard with the just with the playmaking and assists he can provide for the team. But I just I still don't see him being a full time Big Ten contributor, whatever you want to call it. But I don't know. I I do like your reasoning on Sincere Harris, and just from a fan standpoint, that dude is so fun to watch. Like I, I don't know how to say it, but like I, I'm not usually I'm not typically laughing during Illinois games, but like during his freshman year, he would do. He would do stuff that, like, I'm just sitting on my couch that dying laughing because he's, like, he's diving across the court. He's, like, he would have a fake. <laughs> he would be, he'd be, like, hustling so hard. He'd have an injury every single game. <laughs> then he'd run out of the tunnel. Like, <laughs> the State Farm Center, like, erupts in applause when he runs out of the tunnel. Like, he's just so funny. Off the court, he, he seems so funny, too. So, I, I, I guess I would probably still have him fourth because – like Nico, like I'll believe the offensive improvements when I see it. And I think Ty Rogers can still just at this point, I don't think Ty Rogers will ever have a jump shot. I don't know if that's fair to say he could totally develop one this season for whatever reason, but I, I think he can still improve pretty drastically in some aspects. Like I think he could be a better defender, uh, like a full-time defender if he's not having to guard six foot guys uh, the entire season. Because just just because Illinois was so big last season, he ended up guarding six foot one guards that just they kind of blew by him. And with the switching everything, like I don't, he was kind of it didn't really seem like he was in the right role defensively the entire season. So I think he could improve there. And I think I don't know if he has a jump shot, like that would obviously be awesome. Not but happening. I, not happening. Not happening. Okay. Yeah. Well, May, maybe he could make like a twelve footer by the end of his career. Yeah, like, how about like a floater? I, He's not going to make a three throughout his college career. I could, I would put a lot of money down right now. Ty Rogers will not make a three. I didn't watch his high school highlights, but like, is there a reason for that? Like, couldn't he shoot in high school? Well, I mean, I think his evaluation in high school was that the jump shot needs a lot of work, but he wasn't not taking any jumpers in high school. Like he could make a three in high school. He can make a 12 footer. He would, he had a float game. I don't yeah it's it's odd that he's just completely refused to shoot in college or even really put a lot of emphasis on trying to improve that because it wasn't like a complete in in high school based on what I remember from his evaluation it's like obviously this is a guy that's not going to shoot 40% from 3 in college but he was making some like he was a threat like he he wasn't on team USA as on team USA's under 18 team before he got to Illinois because he could only make six footers like he had a bit of a perimeter game I, it's it's weird I, it's it's not going to happen at this point in my eyes yeah so i guess i, I don't know like Ty and sincere three and four. I guess my logic's kind of flawed if I'm like 
petitioning for a tie jump shot and a sincere jump shot. I don't know. We'll see if either will happen, but I don't know. I think for sure, just the four young guys, uh, Ty, Sincere, Dre, and Amani, top four for sure. And then Nico slides in the bottom spot just because he hasn't shown as much as anybody else has. And then Luke Goody at five because I, I don't think he'll improve drastically, but he is a fun player to watch. You'll take that shooting any day, and he's he could be a good leader as a, a fourth-year senior on this team. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you'd love to have older guys too. And the other thing with Luke is that – that guy shows up in the postseason. I mean, he's been here three years. All three years, he has been a huge part of the postseason for Illinois, and it just seems like he is not afraid of that moment, and he's made some huge shots in uh, three different postseasons for Illinois now. So that's another thing. I mean, Again, when, ranking these might be a little unfair, too, because it, it puts like a – I want every guy back. If I could have every guy back, I'd want every guy back. But at the end of the day – decisions probably have to be made in this day and age and, and Illinois is going to be active in the portal and, and these guys are going to be having people in their ear. So it's, it's, it, it'd be probably very uh, overconfident to think that you'd get all these guys back. That's kind of the point of the exercise real quick though. What role do you envision for each of these guys next season? Like assuming you Illinois were to get everyone back the interesting part about this group of returnees is that you have a lot of guys with upside and guys that I think are going to be useful pieces on good teams. I don't think you have any surefire starters like of this group. I don't think you could point out one guy and say that guy is going to start next season and play 30 minutes a game. And that's, that's a unique position to be in because normally and I know, I guess two years ago, similar spot, although you did have Coleman Hawkins who you came back. So you had at least one guy you could trust to start, but most times like, yeah, there's a lot of roster turnover. There's a lot of transfer situations. You at least have one, maybe two guys that you can pencil into your starting lineup and Illinois. I I think one or two of these guys probably will end up starting, but it's interesting because I don't think you can necessarily trust a single one of these returnees to be like a featured big time like guy that's going to be your second or third option coming back next season. Is that fair? Do you think that that's on the table for any of these guys? Or do you think that these are guys that for next year specifically are probably more complimentary pieces? It's so tough to say, like you have like three debatable point guards on that, in that group of five or six players. Like if Illinois gets a really hot point guard out of the transfer portal, is Nico Moretti starting? No. Is Sincere starting? Probably not. Is Ty starting? I don't know. Like, is Ty going to continue to bring the ball up the next couple years? No. Depends I, on if we I, have I a point really guard. I highly but, doubt it. Yeah, probably not. So, and you made the point, too, real quick. Like, you were completely right. It would benefit Ty Rogers to not have him in that role, especially defensively, because you're completely right. Ty Rogers is a really talented defender when he's guarding his position. And I think this year he got exploited because he was out of position. And I just he's not the most laterally quick defender there is out there. He's not the best screen navigator there is out there. If he's guarding a three or a four, I think he could be really good. I'm pretty sure Illinois is going to realize that and say, we can't do this again with him for his own good. Yeah, for sure. And you look at somebody like somebody like Luke Goody, he was fine in the starting role this season. If you go into next season with him in your starting lineup, nobody's really complaining. I don't think at least in my mind, but also like he won't be your best starter. So I don't know. Luke could start. Ty could start. I honestly thought going into this season, since here Harris had a, a chance as, as being the starting point guard. I know they said Ty would be uh, Ty would be like primary ball handler, but uh, it didn't really work out that way. I thought Sincere had, had a decent chance of starting, like in the summer at least, but then obviously it turns out he wanted to redshirt. So I don't I, I doubt Dre Gibbs Lawhorn is your starting point guard next season. I would kind of be shocked at that, or even the starting two guard. So I don't know. Like I think like you said, one or two of them will start for sure. I doubt we get four starters starters out of the transfer portal, or maybe Marez starts. I don't know. We'll see. It, it's it's so tough to say in April even. I honestly do think that of the guys that will be on Illinois roster next year, or that we think will be on Illinois roster next year, Marez Johnson has the highest likelihood to start. I think that's <laughs> actually true. 
Uh, but it, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it is hard to say, and that can kind of transition us into our final discussion here, which is biggest needs in the transfer portal, because that's going to determine it all at the end of the day. I, I, my point in that question was more so like, I don't think there's most of these guys, you could see a world where they start, but it's really going to depend on which guys Illinois brings in. You don't have one guy in that group. While I think you have good players that you want on that next year's roster that can be big pieces on next year's roster. You don't have one guy you can circle and say, all right, we're building our lineup around this guy or all right, well, this guy's penciled into our, small forward let's go build a like it's just going to depend on which pieces you get which guys fit better i think there are questions like whether it is sincere harris whether it is ty rogers or hansberry in the front court like fit is going to be a big part of that too because if you have three guys that are questionable shooters i don't think you want to play ty rogers in that lineup and you know all of a sudden you're going to be the worst three-point shooting team in the big 10 Amani Hansberry, you don't really know if he's a four or a five. If Merez Johnson is your starter, do you want to play those two together, or would it be better to put Amani on the bench as a backup? Like Dre Gibbs Lawhorn, it depends how many guards you add because he's probably your best returning guard. But if you add three guards in the portal, all of a sudden he's probably not as high on the priority list. So it's going to depend, I think, heavily on who Illinois adds. And honestly, who Illinois ads will probably tell us a lot about how they feel about some of these guys, because if there's one guy that maybe they do leave an opening for, that tells you that they're probably higher on one guy than another. So a lot of these questions are probably going to be answered in the off season. It's going to be fascinating. Illinois is in a really fascinating spot to lose four of five starters. And the one starter you bring back is one that had to sit on the bench for 32 minutes of the UConn elite eight game for matchup reasons. Like it's, I, I don't know who you can necessarily trust. There's a lot to work with, but it's going to be interesting to see what kind of role each of these guys carves out. And like we said, probably not, there's probably going to be one or two that hit the portal. So um, that'll play itself out, but. The best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines for making all of our picks and predictions, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use bonus code FIELD, and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money to get it. This is what you have to do to make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using that bonus code FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. You'll get up to $1,500 in bonus bets if your bet loses. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly, we have some fun stuff coming up for the rest of the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boost, and the thing that I love the most, a nice little parlay boost, as well as a ridiculous array of prop bets for anything that you could possibly imagine betting on. From odds on getting to the Final Four to National Championship futures, I'm calling it right now. BetMGM is the king of the prop bet. So go download the BetMGM app. Use that code FIELD and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the Field of 68 content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod in any podcast app. Like and share the YouTube videos that you enjoy. Tell your friends about us. It all helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. Let's talk transfer portal needs for Illinois. And this can kind of tie back a little bit to what we were just talking about, too. But let's kind of go back and forth here and make a list of, you know, if you're going out and you're Brad Underwood and you're surfing through the transfer portal, how would you rank the needs of this Illinois team, whether it's positionally, whether it's role? I think there's some clear ones, and it's really, honestly, you probably, everything is probably at least somewhat of a need on this team, but I think there's probably some some needs that are higher on the list than others. So what would be your number one need for this Illinois team? If, if you had to get one guy out of the portal, what does that guy look like? I don't know. Like I'm, I'm thinking everybody's in agreement that the top two options are like clear cut starting point card and like a wing scorer. Am I, am I right there? Like, I, yes. I, just, I don't know what I want more, honestly. That was my top two. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And honestly, I'll broaden it and say this. Like, it's not a position, but 
your number one need in the point guard is a star player. Like you need, you need a guy who's going to be an all conference performer out of the portal. Cause I don't think you have that in any of the guys we just talked about for next year. I think you have guys that can develop into that. I don't think you have a returning star player or a guy that's going to be a featured option on your team. So you need a go-to scorer, whether that is at the point guard spot or whether that is on the wing, I suspect it'll probably be a wing. So probably a wing star go-to scoring type, uh, a guy that would kind of be your Terrence Shannon or Marcus Damask replacement from a scoring perspective would be my number one need. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty in alignment there. I like that. So I'd say wing score, big physical guy that can like pr- preferably be a three level scorer. Like you kind of see what Marcus Damask did. If you consider him a wing scorer, I guess can, he can, uh, I don't know if the next guy we take out of the portal is going to be a booty ball player, but like being able to shoot and drive to some extent and just get into the lane and score at will is it's preferable for sure. And then a point guard, like Illinois really hasn't had a true point guard. We say it every off season, but like we, we just haven't had a true point guard in years at this point. Uh, so having that, like having a guy that can just put the ball in his hands and he can run whatever offense you want to run. He can come off a pick and roll and, score or distribute the ball like whatever you want like just find a guy that can do that please it, we had a great season this past year without a guy like that I, I, even though Marcus Damask kind of ended up being a guy like that but having a guy for 30 plus games that can do that pretty consistently would be awesome as an Illinois fan and then number three like obviously a huge need I think you need some front court depth like whatever if, if it's a five man or if it's a stretch four like whatever you, whatever you end up getting I just I don't think you can run into a season with Marez and Amani as your top two or like top two minute getting front court pieces. So we'll see what happens there. Do you think we're getting like I mean now if you get those three plus Jake Davis, that's four transfer portal pieces. So where would we be on scholarships? Like I, I think Illinois will get five transfers this offseason if I had to guess. Now I don't have the exact scholarship count, but I'm factoring in that I think one more guy will transfer from the guys we yeah, talked right. about. And honestly, that would probably leave still an open scholarship. So it's interesting. And I think that there's some developments happening where I think one more scholarship is going to open with the freshman class. We'll wait to talk about that until that becomes more official, which I think will happen soon. Um, so I think you're going to only bring in two freshmen uh, at the end of the day. And so, I, yeah, honestly, I haven't done the math on scholarships, but I think Illinois probably gets four more transfers alongside Jake Davis would be my guess. And, and that's not to say all those guys are going to be starters, but I, I think we're on the same page in needs. Like number one is a go-to scoring option all-conference star caliber player. A.J. Storr is a guy who's been in the portal that Illinois has been connected to. That would fit the mold. I know you're laughing because you're not a big fan of his, um, which we could talk about. Hey, listen, A.J. AJ Storr commits to Illinois in 10 minutes. Your reaction is what? All right, I've been, like, off the air, I've been saying <laughs> I'm not watching a game if A.J. Storr is on the team next year. Is, that, Mike Farmer is the number can... one A.J. Storr hater, people. <laughs> Okay, but let me preface this by saying if he commits, I'm not keeping that agenda up. I'll be his biggest fan. Like, I, I don't care if he puts up 20 shots a game. I'll root for him. But I, I don't know. Like, obviously, he puts up – what did he have 17 a game this year? Like, good shooting numbers. Just a big big physical athletic wing. Like, I'll take that any day. But I, some of the stuff you watch from him, like, you knew he was entering the portal in, like, February, whether that's on – fit or like wanting more money or Wisconsin just being in a slump. Like, I don't know. I don't have the info on what that actually was, but like uh, this could be my worst take ever, but uh, some of his shot selection, I know Wisconsin like always needs a score like that. Like Johnny Davis was running that team a couple of years ago. He just took whatever shot he wanted. Thor was the same way just because they have four other white dudes that can't do anything offensively. But I don't know. Like uh, some of the shot selection, some of like, like he he, put, he throws a shot off the backboard against Illinois in the championship game and tries to dunk it. Like that gives me Matthew Meyer vibes, a guy that just is talented, no doubt. But there's some concerns on like whether it's IQ or just not giving a shit. Like I I don't know. I'll be his biggest fan if he commits here. I, I <laughs> I'll stop complaining. But like I don't know. I feel like there's some issues that 
we say Brad Underwood can fix, but then you see Matthew Meyer and Sky Clark, and it's like the season was a complete train wreck. So I don't know. I, I Hopefully I have to walk this take back 100%, and he commits, and he's an all-conference player, but I don't know. And it's April. I, I have some concerns. No, I I think some of the concerns are fair, but the bottom line for me is a guy is really talented and just put up 17 a game in the Big Ten. Like, that's the type of guy Illinois needs to get, a guy who's proven he's an all-conference performer in the Big Ten, and his athleticism and his open court ability, like, he has some similarities to Terrence Shannon. And, in fact, I'll, I'll hit you with this to try and disprove. Like, I get he was a bit of a high-volume scorer, and there were some games where he was inefficient, but – AJ Storr's numbers last year, 17 points a game, four rebounds a game, 43% from the floor, 32% from three. Terrence Shannon's numbers two years ago, his first year with Illinois, 17 points a game, five rebounds a game, 44% from the floor, 32% from three. I mean, and AJ Storr is a sophomore, and and so I think he's going to continue to get better. I think that there's some things in terms of just shot selection and playing within a team that Illinois can kind of smooth out in his game. I, I agree with you that there were some times watching Wisconsin where it was like, it's AJ store time, folks. He's taking the next five shots, regardless of, you know, how contested they are, where they're at. I understand that part of it, but at the end of the day, this is a, a proven all conference level performer, really talented six, seven athlete, like, if you're trying to pluck a Terrence Shannon replacement out of the portal, I'm not saying that he's going to be Terrence Shannon, but if you're trying to like find a guy that can do 75% of what Terrence Shannon can do, I mean, this guy, I, I think it would be a, a home run and would be a, a great headliner to a portal class for Illinois. And um, rumors are that there's some mutual interest there. Now I think that there's going to be some big players and some big NIL checks being thrown around in this recruitment, you've heard Kansas's name thrown out there, Kentucky's name thrown out there. It's going to be a tough one, but A.J. Stewart was committed to Illinois three years ago and has a relationship and is from Rockford. I think Illinois will be a player in this one. I think it'd be a great fit when I'm talking about, like, star caliber wing. It's probably as good as you'll find in this portal class. So uh, I think that's one to keep an eye on for sure. I do see your concerns, though. There's He's definitely not a perfect player. Um. Let's see, point guard wise. Yeah, point guard. We talked about that. That would definitely be my number two is a true point guard, a true distributor, a guy who can run your offense. I would prefer that guy be old. Like I, I've always said, like throughout this season, I would really want a fifth year COVID. This is the last year of COVID years. Get me the most experienced point guard you can find out in the portal. Now, there's not a ton of names that fit that description currently in the portal, but there's going to be some, I would imagine. And I think there will be some intriguing point guard options for Illinois. And that would be one where, yeah, I, I look, you had a top five offense in the country this year without a point guard. You're not going to have a Terrence Shannon and Marcus Damask on that offense next year. I think it would really help Illinois to get a true veteran point guard that can help run things that you can run some more traditional ball screens for, and a guy that, you know, you can just trust with the ball in his hands. And uh, preferably for me, that guy would be an older guy. But I know, you know, you find a younger younger piece, whatever it is. I, I, I think just a true distributing, playmaking point guard would be a guy that I would have a lot of interest in if I'm Illinois. Yeah, I'll just – I'll be honest. I've completely given up on following, recruiting. Like, I used to be a huge, like, message board, like, fanatic. I'd be looking at who recruits and following our stuff, following and on Instagram, but like I've, I've completely given up on that. So I, I don't really, have there been names, like you said, there haven't been many, but are there any potential names out there? From the point guard, like true point guard front, not really, not really. There's been some combo guards like Dante Maddox out of Toledo is a guy that I think yeah. Illinois has a good chance at. He's not a true point guard. He played point guard for Toledo last year. Two years ago, he was in uh, the two guard next to Ray J. Dennis. Who? Uh oh, Toledo point guard, Illinois going after. That might not end well, huh? But no, I think this is a little bit different. But um, with him, he's more of a, a scorer. He's a guy who shot 40% from three. I think you probably envision him playing off the ball more, 
Marcus Hill from Bowling Green is a guy who played point guard, another Mac point guard from last year. Not a very high assist rate. Guy who averaged 20 a game. He wants to get downhill. He wants to score more than anything. From the traditional point guard front, like there hasn't been a ton. I know there's one guy, and I'll just say it because I think people kind of have heard the name, Kylan Boswell from Arizona, not in the portal yet. Rumors are he might enter the portal. He's from Champaign. That's one where I think would be a, a natural fit. Now he's younger. He was a, a sophomore this past year, but really should have been a freshman because he reclassed two years ago. He hasn't even turned 19 yet. So that would kind of not fit my veteran you know, mold. And he had some ups and downs, but he's one that if he were to enter the portal, I'm not breaking any news here. I think anyone who's in tune on Illinois recruiting has heard that name come up. I, I don't like shouting names out that aren't in the portal, but I think that's one that many people have discussed already. Other than that, though, I don't know. I, I think there's going to be some that hit the next 24 days, but it's kind of bare right now. I, I still think that that'll happen at some point where there'll be a couple of true point guard targets. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. I don't, you just you look at a guy like Ray J last year, obviously you don't, you don't end up getting him. Would have completely changed like the – just the way this team looked, but he goes to Baylor. He didn't have like a first team, all big 12 caliber season, but Baylor gets a three seed. Like you paired him with a really solid wing kind of guard score, like Jacoby Walter, some other good pieces. And he just, for the most part, he ran that offense so fluidly, uh, like their defense struggled, but like just the makeup of that team was a great offense. They bowed out early in March, but like you'll take that type of season like any year. He just, was able to do so much for that Baylor team. But, yeah, I don't know. If, if there's not that many names out there, I don't know. Like, I, I can't just speculate on uh, certain guys I would want. But, like, Colin Boswell seems like he would be a good fit. Obviously, just him being so young didn't really work out in, at Arizona. He had some great games individually, but he just he was kind of a ghost. Some other games was kind of sitting on the bench late in games and a lot of their big games in favor of older veteran guards playing in front of him. So that was interesting. I, I guess I could kind of see why he would want to transfer. I think I would take him. I, I think I would for sure take him, just given a couple years of eligibility left from Champagne, has shown flashes of what he can do at a, at a high major level against some really good competition. So, yeah, I would take him for sure if he did end up entering the portal. But, yeah, other than that, you mentioned, was it Marcus Hill from Bowling Green? or And then Maddox. Yeah, I've seen people speculating on Maddox. So that would be interesting. I don't think that's really the star piece you're looking for, like you said, like more of a probably off the bench, uh, off the ball scorer. But yeah, these are good pieces. Like Jake Davis isn't the star you're looking for, but everybody's pretty pretty satisfied with that pickup at this point. So yeah, I, I think more people will enter the portal, more names will show themselves as, as time progresses. But yeah, just some, some things to look for. Uh, I think the other one I was going to hit on, the other need that you kind of hit on as well, was a front court piece for sure would, would come next on the list. And I would say that I think it needs to be a stretch big, whether that's at the four, whether that's at the five. It's got to be a guy who can stretch the floor a little bit. Because I think you have, you know, with Amani Hansberry and Merez Johnson, those guys aren't complete non shooters. Like we saw, Amani Hansberry made two threes against UConn. Merez Johnson has improved his outside game a little bit. He's not a guy who's going to come in and take a lot of them next year, but that's in his future, I think. But both those guys are going to be mainly non-shooters next season. And so I think if you're trying to piece the ideal veteran front court fit next to those two younger guys, it's a guy who can space the floor a little bit. It's a guy who maybe in the right lineup could be a Coleman Hawkins. If you're in a certain matchup with a traditional big, who's not as good out on the perimeter, a guy that could play a small ball five and stretch the floor, give you some lineup flexibility. That would be my number three need would be a stretch big of some sort. Uh, and one that would kind of seamlessly fit at either the four or the five alongside Merez Johnson, alongside Amani Hansberry. And uh, again, I would love to be it to be an older guy. I think, I, I think, you know, 
talking about a lot of these transfer fits. Now, it's not always going to work out that way. Like A.J. Storr is a sophomore. Boswell would be a sophomore. You're not going to be picky about it if there's talent that fits your roster. But I think Brad Underwood has proven that, especially with a lot of youth coming back, he's going to prioritize older guys. So in my mind, it would be a veteran piece that probably either has one year eligibility left or maybe two because I think you have your front court of the future already coming in but a guy that can complement those guys, mentor those guys, and also fit alongside those guys would be a guy that I'd be very interested in. Uh, we can get to a couple names in a minute, but it, is that a fair assessment, you think? Yeah, I'm with you there. I think, like you said, Amani's shown a bit of potential from uh, from distance this past season. Marez, I don't think he's ever really been the shooting type. He's just – it's tough when you're in high school, unless, like, you've grown up a shooter. If you're, like – He's like six eleven, right? Like, you don't need to be a shooter at St. Rita when you're just so much more physical, so much bigger than every single center you're playing in high school in like Chicago. So yeah, if he could de- develop a three, I-, I doubt that happens at this point, but that would be awesome. Yeah, I- I'm in agreement with you there. I think getting another super long, super just old team because you've got a pretty solid core of younger pieces that haven't really proven themselves too much but like they've shown flashes of potential each one of them have so having that core of pieces you throw in somebody like store who's would be a great wing scorer uh throwing a point guard hopefully whether it's a young guy like boswell or somebody old that hasn't really uh that we don't know a ton about yet and then yeah adding like a stretch four maybe a stretch five even just somebody that's long can play just a shred of defense hopefully because we had some just we had some defensive issues this year that hurt us a little bit but like you'll take that offensive caliber team every every time uh if you have the choice because we've seen offense like offense had a huge kind of jump this season and like good offensive teams just had great runs in march you're good offensive teams are the best ones standing yeah for sure so just building around offense having a uh proven proven shooting floor would be would be awesome I don't know if you have names for us but yeah i'm i'm all in on that i think that's your probably third third most uh third piece piece you want the most i don't know what i'm saying but yeah for sure yeah although i think you do bring up a good point like i think illinois found something with the way they built their offense last year that they're going to want to continue and just build teams that are really competitive offensively at the same time i think in the portal you do want to land some defenders and guys that can elevate your defense because i i don't think I don't think anyone on the Illinois coaching staff would tell you that they'd be happy having the 95th ranked defense in the country again next year. I think especially a guy like Chester Frazier is on the staff doing a lot of portal work. He's not going out there to build the offensive all-star team. He wants to guard a little bit too. That's a guy who uh, definitely wants to guard. And, And Brad Underwood came to Illinois with a defensive reputation. So, you know, I think that's something that's going to, probably be top of mind in the portal as well is let's improve defensively while still maintaining our offensive upside that we saw uh names wise in the front court some names that have been floated around i know danny wolf out of yale's a guy who michigan is recruiting really hard but illinois he's from illinois one that illinois might be interested in he's a guy who obviously was in the tournament with yale this past year beat auburn He's a stretch big, played the five for them, could play the four, uh, can shoot it, uh, can pass. Kind of like, you know, you pluck out a, a Coleman Hawkins replacement out of the portal. He's one that fits that mold in a lot of areas. Maybe other than defensively would be the one area where he wouldn't mirror that. Um, but in terms of an offensive game, I think that's one I know that uh, – Illinois had a Zoom meeting with uh, Notre Dame stretch big Kerry Booth, who was a freshman last year, a guy who was up and down, but he's got some shooting upside and he's more of a four that I think would 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 be able to stretch the floor a little bit and is one that with three years eligibility left could be developed a little bit more. Um Let's see. I know there's Stan- there's a Stanford big man, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce his name because it's French that Illinois is involved oh, yeah. with. Maxime Reynaud, I think, might be the best shot I'll give at pronouncing that one. He had a heck of a year, average 15 and 10 for Stanford, can shoot it a little bit, can block shots. He'd be more of a true five, um, but but one that could 
stretch the floor a little bit. I don't know. That one seems like there's a lot of names in that one. There's some lower tier guys from some smaller schools. I know if Illinois wants to keep the Southern Illinois pipeline alive, they've got a stretch four who's in the portal, Xavier Amos, who Illinois is recruiting. Uh, and he shot 38% from three, six, eight, four. So there's some names. And again, there's probably going to be 57 more names that come on Illinois radar in the next 25 days as guys continue to hit the portal. Those are just some of the ones that I know Illinois is recruiting right now. But um, and those are some younger guys, too. So that doesn't necessarily fit the mold of older. Those are more maybe developmental pieces other than the obviously proven Wolf and Raynaud. But um, yeah, I think front court is a big need. You're going to need a front court piece. You're not going to go into next year with your only two front court guys being Hansberry and Merez Johnson. You don't want to have to rely on that youth. You want to give Merez some help, especially not rely on him to play 30 minutes at center next year. Like a, a guy that can play that. I think Amani can play center too. I think long-term Illinois season is more of a four. So a guy that maybe has some positional flexibility, um, and one that maybe is, is a little bit more of a floor spacer would be a big need. And then once you kind of go down the list, it's more so just with guys that fit. Like a guy like a Dante Maddox from Toledo doesn't necessarily fit in any of those three categories. But if Illinois likes him and they want him, he could play a big role. He's a guy who made a lot of shots for Toledo. He could kind of seamlessly slide into that Justin Harmon type of sixth man guard scoring role. Probably do it a lot better than Harmon did the last month of the season. Uh, and, and so that's a guy that I think would make a lot of sense. And Another wing, I think, would be a need, not one that maybe is the star caliber of like an A.J. Store, but one that could come off the bench and give you some wing minutes, maybe a defensive guy off the bench with some size and length, uh, especially knowing that you'll bring Luke Goody off the bench and that's a guy that you can't really trust in the defensive end, maybe more of a defensive-minded wing with some length would be a need. Um so I, I think there's a lot of other areas they can go. But bottom line of this transfer portal cycle for Illinois is you need a lot of guys, and this is going to be a brand-new roster for next year. Yeah, for sure. After, after like, the first three, I would say I agree, I agree with you. Like, get some more depth at the two, three, the four. Or like, even – I don't know, even the one. Actually, not the one because you'll have, a, hopefully, a point guard and then Dre or Nico, Sincere, whoever you want. But yeah, for sure, some depth at the more depth at guard or wing, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, just losing pretty much your starting lineup, losing Coleman, Damask, Shannon, Quincy, Harmon, Dane too. Like, there's a lot of uh, a lot of holes to be filled. But I, just with Brad's Brad and the staff's like transfer portal resume at this point, I'm not worried about it. Guys, guys' names always pop out. Like it can be July or whatever. You'll there's some new guy you hear about that Illinois could go get. Uh, then you've got a solid freshman class, hopefully with Merez being the main focal point there. Uh, just some good returning pieces, a young core of guards especially. But, yeah, I, I trust Brad Underwood and the staff. I think he's a good start with Jake Davis, Davis from Mercer, good shooter, can shoot off the dribble, can hopefully defend a bit better, better this season. Yeah, I'm pretty optimistic. I think they'll they'll hit on some of the needs we've talked about today, and we'll be right back in contention next season. I don't know how the Big Ten's going to be next year. Like, it seems like we're losing as a conference. We're losing the majority of the somewhat good players. So, I think it's pretty wide open. But other teams will fill their needs and stuff. But we'll see. it's impossible to project anything. Like, I I laugh whenever someone releases like their way too early top twenty five or there. I'm like, what are? You, why even waste your time? Like the every roster that you just broke down will have four new pieces in it. They're one one. 15 of those guys will transfer and there'll be 17. There's no point in projecting anything until like May 20th, like at the earliest, like you just, it's, it's a completely different stratosphere that we live in, in college basketball. I agree with you though. Like you look through the all conference teams in the big 10 from this year, you're losing pretty much every guy. Like most of the guys like AJ store would be the best returning piece. I think uh, from, from that group. If he stays in the Big Ten, he's in the portal. Um, and, and, yeah, you lose Edie, which is huge. And Obviously, Purdue brings a lot back, but Edie gone, all those veteran guards gone, Boo Booey, Jameer Young, Tyson Walker, Terrence Shannon, Damask is gone. Oh, one other thing I did want to touch on is I know that there's a lot of discussion 
among Illinois fans about, well, Marcus Damask is applying for a waiver. Could Illinois have Damask back? No, <laughs> that, that's my short answer to that. I would be absolutely stunned if that happened. The NCAA has pretty much set a precedent so far that uh, anything that happened during that 2020-21 season is already been given back to players. So you're not getting an additional year to the one you already got back for that season. So Marcus Damask only played 10 games 2020-2021 with an injury. And uh, I would give that about a 1% chance of happening personally. So that's why we did not discuss any of this with the idea that Damask could be on the team. If for some miracle that happens, obviously that'd be incredible. I would probably not bank on that if I were anybody out there. So just did just want to mention How that. How about one. a Coleman fifth year? That's also on the table. I would say no to that as well. I don't think that's going to happen either. And also I think Coleman should enter the draft because this draft class is so bad. You're never going to have a better chance to get drafted than this year. I think Coleman could – Definitely get at least like a two-way contract in this class for sure. Um, but uh, anyway, just to, to finish up the Big Ten point, yeah, losing a ton of talent, probably going to bring in a ton of talent. Going to be interesting to see what Indiana does coming off such a disaster year. Feels like they've been connected to every transfer. They're bringing in another five-star freshman. They get back some guys. You know, are they going to have a much better portal cycle this year than last year and actually get guys who know what a three-point shot is? Uh, that will be interesting. Dusty May at Michigan might just bring FAU to Michigan next year, which was a tournament team. They're like trash, dude. I, I'm not sold on John L. Davis and Vlad Golden. Like, they're talented, but they – Janelle Davis is, was fantastic. In the yeah, no, I, I get that. At the same time, though, you have to look at it like this is a Michigan team that was 8-24 and 24 last year. And it's Dusty May's first season. If he's just bringing a tournament caliber roster with him his first year, like that's a good start. Like, I mean, yeah, that's, that's fair. to go from eight and 24 to a two all AAC guys and John L. Davis, who averaged like 19 a game. If they do get him, I don't know if they will. I think they probably will get Vlad Golden with uh, Dusty May there. Just it'll be interesting to see because I know they've been very active in the portal as well. How will Purdue look next year without Edie? Will they go to the portal and try to just go get the best big man that's in the portal and say, hey, look what we just did with Zach Edie. Come be our next Edie. Or will they ride with their development and whatnot? I'd be very interested to see that. If they decide no portal, we're, you know, Will Berg is our center next year. Trey Kaufman Wren with the guy. I think there's a, a regression coming for those Purdue guards without Edie. Might be a wake up call next year. <laughs> I, I think they'll be I love, they'll be a tournament team, but there's going to be some regression coming if they don't. I, I, if I'm Matt Painter, I'm going and I'm big game hunting the best centers in the portal personally. There's nothing funnier to me than uh, Purdue fans on Twitter like, oh, they, they, they think this is the best we're going to be, and then they show like the lineup of Camden <laughs> Heidi, <laughs> Camden Heidi, TKR, Will Berg. Oh my God, we're we're terrified of this team next year. I don't. I'm going to have to eat my words guaranteed because they always just – they just develop kids like it's crazy. But nobody is scared of those bums without ED. Like, they're going to regress <laughs> so bad, hopefully. But, eh. yeah, I don't know. Don't They'll probably go find somebody. If, They'll be great any, again. If any Purdue fan somehow listens to this, which I don't know why you would, you got a national title game coming up. But uh, that one that one is not going to – be kind, those bums. I wouldn't go that far. I Fletcher think you lawyer, got... Fletcher Lawyer is going to shoot 26% from three next year. Like when he can't just flop and pass, all he does <laughs> is pass into Edie. Like he doesn't even shoot threes anymore. He just like lobs it into Edie. It's the most frustrating thing ever. Okay. I don't know why I'm even ranting about that, but like I hope you can beat some by 20. Yeah, well, we, we could give a quick thought on that game. But, yeah, no, I think uh, if I'm Purdue, I'm going and trying to replace ED externally as opposed to internally because otherwise I, th I think, listen, like they have good players still, but I think there's going to be a big wake-up call without ED opening everything up for everybody that like – for the Purdue fans that think we'll just bring back the guys we're going to bring back without Edie and we'll win the Big Ten next year, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I'd be interested to see that. Maybe I'll be wrong, but I don't know if that's happening. Um, and then you got to, and you know Maryland's landed a couple portal guys, and you know will Michigan State go to the portal for the first time ever? If they don't, <laughs> good luck, Tom. But uh, I don't know. Big Ten will be interesting. 
but uh, yeah, we've, we've gone pretty long here. I do just real quick before we wrap it up one minute on the national title game uh, for anyone listening to this on Monday, April 8th national title game tonight, UConn Purdue. I'm excited for it because this tournament has been a snooze fest and this is the two best teams in the country going at it. So hopefully this one is at least an exciting game. But uh, do you think UConn just continues to dominate or do you think Purdue can finally give them a challenge? I think somewhere in the middle. I, I, if UConn wins by 26, I will my jaw will be dropped. But I, I don't think Purdue wins. I don't think they really come close to winning. I picture it being like UConn has a six to eight point lead the whole time and they end up winning by 12, like kind of continue that streak of double digit wins. I just, I think Klingon will be able, he's not going to neutralize Edie. Like nobody really can, but I think he can slow him down and like not, they're not going to have to double Edie as much as every team does. And then that lawyer and Gillis and Jones to some extent, like I think UConn and UConn just so good defensively too. Like these lawyer Gillis Smith, all these, all these guys aren't going to get as many open shots as they usually do. I think they'll be rattled a little bit. Like Braden Smith probably won't have a terrible game, but he just did against uh, NC State. Like he looks awful. So I think UConn, UConn's just better still. Like, Purdue's second best team in the country. Sure, I'll give you that. But UConn is still on, on a different level. I think they win by probably 10 to 12. Yep, I'm, I'm pretty much aligned with you. I think, I mean, I, Edie's the best player on the court still, but if there's one guy in the country who can actually make Edie's life hard one-on-one without needing to double, it's Donovan Klingon. So I don't think I don't think Edie's going to be shut down. I don't, I'm not saying Klingon can shut him down. I'm just saying, like, you've got the perfect matchup of anybody in the country to match up with Edie one-on-one, and then I think the supporting cast, like, I just trust UConn's guys so much more to make shots – to step up they've been here before in this moment i trust tristan newton more than i do braden smith the way braden smith played here recently i I know newton hasn't been great either but this is a guy who was starting in last year's national title game i think he's gonna come to play like the way stefan castle has played for uconn and cam spencer and alex caravan i just outside of the bigs which is going to be the focal point of the matchup i have a lot more trust in what uconn's guys are going to do and the way that they've just dominated teams like purdue's probably going to give them their biggest test but i still think uconn probably when the final score maybe with some late game fouling in there and one late run whatever i think it's going to be another double digits for uconn i think they win by 10 or 11 points when it's all said and done but i think it'll be a competitive exciting game at least which i hope it is because this tournament has been kind of a snooze fest. It's been, uh, hasn't been the finest tournament in terms of excitement. So it would be great if we could get an exciting championship game, but um, that should wrap things up for us. Anything else you got to add? I don't know. I kind of agree with you. Like I'll watch if the tournament was like the 68 worst teams in the country, I would watch and have fun with it. But I think if Illinois didn't have this run this year, I would like, I would have lost interest. Right. Like, yeah. NC State was awesome, awesome run, but like this Final Four was kind of not that interesting. Sweet 16 was cool. Elite Eight had some good games, but yeah, I'm in agreement with you there. Yep, no question. Um, in terms of our recording schedule, it probably is just going to depend on when news drops at this point. We'll try to have a couple more episodes come out before the summertime, but it's really just going to depend on is there news to discuss, and there probably will be plenty, but we don't know when it's going to come, so stay tuned. It's not going to be a Monday episode every week anymore. It's really just going to be a is there big news to talk about, and we'll talk about it, so stay tuned for that, Um, but for now, this was a loaded episode of Offseason Preview. Uh, make sure to drop a follow on our Twitter at Champagne on Ice. Subscribe to the Field of 68 Podcast Network YouTube channel. Find us on your podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere else. And uh, that should wrap things up. It's uh, going to be a fun off season, probably a stressful one as well, but it's going to be interesting to see how Illinois pieces this roster together, how Brad Underwood uses the momentum from an Elite Eight to build an entire new team for next year. Cause that's pretty much what Illinois is going to need to do. And uh, we will, uh, we will try to react to a lot of it as best we can. So stay tuned for that. But until then try to get some rest during this off season, although there is no time for rest in, in college hoops anymore. Uh, but uh, yeah, 
we sleep in May. It's not May yet. It's only April 7th. And really we sleep in like July now because the, the transfer <laughs> portal doesn't rest in May. So, uh, <laughs> but I uh, hope everybody enjoys their week and enjoy the national title game tonight. And we will see you next time.